I mentioned international trade. That was brought almost to a halt during the war uh, because uh, it was dangerous to, to, to engage in international trade. Now, the way you see that is by going back and looking at the insurance rates. They shot up to many times what they had been before 1914. Uh, there were lots of merchant ships being sunk by the warring powers. Uh, and, and that's how people carried goods and services around international trade for the most part in those days. So, so, so trade was disrupted and uh, reduced to a much lower level. And that in itself meant that the world was going to live at a, at a lower level uh, than it had before. Uh, but these governments didn't stop there. Uh, they, uh, they conscripted millions of men to serve in the armed forces and took them away from productive employments and put them to work uh, killing and destroying property. Uh, that wasn't good for the level of living either, uh, not to mention the human spirit. And... <clears throat> Eventually, they all engaged in what came to be called in those days war socialism, which is to say the governments either nationalized economic activities outright and put government officials in charge of managing them, uh, or they imposed such se severe regulations on uh, private firms that they were, in effect, unable to do much other than what the government wanted them to do. So, so these government actions of taking over the economy and placing it in the service of war making uh, wreaked havoc with the institutional developments of the previous century or more and reduced the world's level of living tremendously. Incomes fell uh, in all the major warring powers in Europe uh, a great deal. And even in the United States, uh, if we look at what happened to uh, civilian goods and services, we find that it was definitely a case where, where guns were being obtained at the sacrifice of butter. Uh, people were living worse. You, you may have seen textbooks that dispute that, but they're wrong. And if you're interested in the evidence, I can give it to you. Uh, so, war as usual was economically devastating, and in this case it was worse than that because it wrecked this wonderful uh, institutional arrangement or set of arrangements that had so greatly facilitated progress. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things it wrecked was the international gold standard that had operated most successfully in the late 19th and early 20th century. This was the the way that nations uh, employed gold as a, as a medium of exchange for making international transactions. that uh, you, you could go anywhere in the world, uh, and if you had uh, some, some gold money in your pocket, you were okay. You could do your business wherever you went because your gold money would trade at, at, uh, at basically ounce for ounce against the gold money of other countries, uh, at least those in the major trading world. So, so we had an international, uh, reliable medium of exchange. Uh, the, uh, the governments all abandoned the gold standard, except for the United States, which abandoned it only for international transactions. It kept it domestically. But uh, all the other major uh, economic powers abandoned it so that the governments could issue a lot of paper money and use that paper money to pay for soldiers and munitions. So the gold standard was abandoned, and, and in the 1920s, the world went through all kinds of troubles and gyrations in an attempt to put it back together. As it turns out, even though they, they, they made various attempts, what they recreated was never like the old gold standard. It was a, a different kind of arrangement that was much less tightly tied to gold and which did not to constrain governments in the way that the old gold standard had constrained them from issuing paper money. So uh, this was an important uh, upshot or, or consequence of World War I was uh, destruction of the genuine gold standard and, uh, and the creation of a lot of uncertainty about the international medium of exchange that would be used for trade and international finance. Uh, as part of the attempt to recreate the old gold standard, the, uh, the Federal Reserve System in the United States 
which you may remember was only created in December 1913 and didn't get going really until uh, late 1914, which is to say just in time for World War I, uh, had been used during the war by the government to, to help the government finance its war expenditures. And, uh, and so the Fed was immediately perverted from what was supposed to be its task, which was smoothing out the business cycle and, and, and getting rid of severe financial panics, uh, and, and placed at the service of the federal government uh, to help it finance its war. But uh, afterwards, the Fed uh, occupied itself in part in trying to help the British return to the gold standard. And one of the things it did in that process was to engage in several spurts of easy money. That is, uh, using uh, open market operations, the Fed purchase of U.S. government securities, to drive up their price and drive down the rate of interest on them so that securities would be less in enticing in the United States and money would not flow out of Great Britain to the United States, making it more difficult for the British to return to the gold standard. The British made things hard on themselves by selecting the wrong rate of exchange between an ounce of gold and the pound sterling. They put too high a pound price on the gold and therefore they overpriced their exports and made life hard for their export industries and the result was a lot of unemployment in those industries. But uh, the, the people who ran the U.S. Federal Reserve System and the people who ran the Bank of England were very tight and so the Fed tried to, to help out the, uh, the friends in England and uh, created uh, easy money along the way in several spurts. Now, uh, as it turned out, that had a consequence. It didn't just have an effect on, on rates of international financial flows, but it also, by making interest rates lower in this country than they would have been if the market had been left alone, it encouraged various kinds of investments that wouldn't otherwise have seemed profitable. When you change the rate of interest, you, you, you change the present value of expected income flows from any investment stream. And the longer the term of that flow of income you expect from an investment stream, the greater effect a change in the interest rate has on it. So what happens when you lower the interest rate artificially, as the Fed did on several occasions in the 1920s, is you, you disproportionately encourage long-term investments. That's stuff like housing construction, office construction, building mines and ports and dams and all kinds of long-lived capital projects. Those things seem like better deals when the rate of interest is low than when the rate of interest is a little higher. So, so the Fed was having the effect by lowering interest rates in the 20s of, of bringing about what Austrian economists call malinvestment, the wrong kind of investment. Don't confuse that with too much investment. That's another matter. It may have done that too, but that's not my point here. The point is that it encouraged distortions in what the Americans were investing in and building up. Now, if it ever turns out that the Fed reverses itself and allows interest rates to rise from an artificially suppressed level, then what will happen is some of these bad investments will be seen to be bad. People will suddenly realize, hey, now when we think about these, term, these income streams in terms of a higher rate of interest, these look like money losing investments. <laughs> and they'll want to abandon some of them. And they will abandon some of them. And when they do, that means a certain volume of resources may be no longer demanded there and unemployed for a time while it finds a new outlet for its employment. So that uh, monkeying with the interest rate, which is what modern monetary authorities do by design is a recipe for bringing about misallocation of resources. Okay? By, it encourages people when interest rates are artificially suppressed to invest in projects that aren't really profitable but are only made to appear profitable by the suppression of the interest rate. Well later on the Fed did change its mind and that had important consequences because uh, uh, the Fed noticed that a lot of the new money that got created in this easy money episode uh, was flowing into the stock market, driving up stock prices in what seemed to be an, 
uh, irrational or unsustainable way, especially in 1927-28. And so the Fed officials decided they need to act to reverse this reduction of interest rates they'd previously brought about, and they did. At which point, we began to see the opposite. We began to see now with higher interest rates, a lot of malinvestments revealed as malinvestments, people starting to go bankrupt, and so forth. It didn't all happen at once. It took a while because whenever uh, you use monetary policy, there are lags in the way it works its way through the economy. It takes sometimes uh, more than a year, maybe two years on some occasions, for changes in monetary policy to work themselves through the economy uh, and have their, have their effects. 